Okay. So, um, so today we're going to do a little bit more about staying live slips. So, I'm sorry I didn't put this up on Learn in time. I think it went up last night, which is about as much use as a chocolate teapot to you guys. Um, so, that's why I printed out all of the, the handouts you have. If you're not surprised by stuff, although you will be surprised. Um, uh, so, there will be quite a lot of maths in this. Um, so, one of the reasons for that is that I just wanted to, to, to make sure that you, you can see as we go through all of basically the rearranging equations, how we get from one thing to another. Okay, you don't, what? Uh, so, so, I would, exp we, talk, we talk about this when I've done the lecture. Okay, um, so uh, the stuff, some of the stuff, definitely not, and I'll show you why when we get to it. Um, uh, I think the stuff that we did in the practical, yeah, I, I would expect you to be able to do that kind of rearranging. Okay? Haven't written the exam yet, so uh, <laughs> deadline for writing the exam was two weeks ago. So, um, so I think one of the, one of the questions which I, I kind of got from you, uh, you guys during the, the practical last week was that you didn't really have a firm grasp of what I was talking about when I was talking about isotopic equilibrium. So this is where you have uh, two or more phases, so well, not strictly phases, but two or, two or more compounds that have got isotopes in them. And the isotopes can say that we're in this, this is, this is for it, CO2 and CO2 on both sides of this equation. So the, 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 the atoms of oxygen 18 can effectively freely exchange from one molecule into uh, the other molecule and back again. So they can, they can freely exchange, so they will basically then partition according to which bonds they want to be in the most. Okay? Using, basically, being ruled by this equation down here. Okay? So with a system like carbon dioxide and water, that's fairly easy. Okay? Because you've got maybe some water molecules and some carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide can freely exchange with the atmosphere. So even if you had <coughs> carbon dioxide and water, that were that not necessarily even dissolved. Okay, but if, as long as some of the CO2 could dissolve, then this concentration and the isotopes in the CO2 in the water and the gas above the water would be able to exchange very easily. And because this water molecule and the CO2 molecule actually have a chemical reaction, okay, so they're constantly binding together to form carbonic acid, and then they go into the rest of the dissolved inorganic carbon, and then they break apart again back into water. Because this is constantly going backwards and forwards, because we're constantly physically breaking the bonds, making bonds all the time, then it's very easy for the isotopes to exchange from one to the other. Okay, so that, that's topic equilibrium. Now, in the case where we're forming something solid, that's a lot more difficult. Okay? So in the case of the isotopic equilibrium between water and calcium carbonate, okay, so this is the, uh, that same type of equation, so we've got a car calcium carbonate molecule, a water molecule, and the oxygen wants to exchange from the carbonate into the water, or the water into the carbonate. Um, it's very hard to do that, okay, because the molecule is physically locked inside this crystal. Okay? So once it's in the crystal, it's very hard for it to get out. Okay? So our water molecule has to go through all of these kind of chemical equilibria from water into carbonic acid and then break apart into um, bicarbonate and carbonate. And, that, and there will be an e isotopic e equilibrium between this water and all of these different phases of dissolved inorganic carbon. But when it then goes to form from either bicarbonate or carbonate, when it goes to form these things, it's very hard for that, for that to exchange back again. So what we're talking about when we're thinking about isotopic equilibrium is at the very point of crystallization. So as the mineral is growing, okay, the, 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 the calcium carbonate and the carbonate or bicarbonate ions, they are selectively being incorporated into the crystal lattice based on their isotopic composition. So there's not quite a backwards and forwards exchange, but the, the incorporation of these um, carbon-bearing species, or oxygen-bearing species in this case, um, into this are dependent on the isotope ratio. 
Okay, so it's not quite the same as a backwards and forwards exchange. Um, and it's even more, um, more complex than that. So, uh, so when minerals calcify, okay, so when, when minerals calcify, when organisms calcify, they form calcium carbonate shells or coccoliths or, or tests or anything like that. It's not seawater is interacting with a mineral. There's this complicated biological process where you have some, some ions or some atoms and some isotopes in seawater. That has to get taken into a cell of some type. Okay, then some chemical reactions or transport processes happen. There's a lot of diffusive processes in here. Okay, and then at some point you can concentrate um, the, the carbonate ions and the calcium ions in such a way that you lead to precipitation of calcium carbonate. And that happens in a number of different ways, in a number of different kind of, so, um, different kinds of forams, uh, mollusks, uh, echinoderms, uh, this weird word here, milo, milo, bent, most benthic forams calcify in a completely different way to planktonic forams. Okay. So the, 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 the details of this, to a certain extent, um, determine the absolute isotopic fractionation, okay? which means that it's, it's very hard for it to truly be in isotopic equilibrium, okay? because the two phases, the, the mineral and the water, aren't actually in contact with each other. Um, yeah, so there's basically it's, you've, got water, you've got oxygen in your water, oxygen in your CO2, those equilibrate to, with the oxygen in the in the carbonate spirit species, and that's that's fairly well in isotopic equilibrium. But then that oxygen has to get through all of this system into the shell. So what do we do about that? Well, we kind of ignore all of the stuff that I told you last week about isotopic equilibrium and all that kind of stuff. So what we do is we go out and we, we find, we go to places in the ocean that are different temperatures, and we find some samples there, either forams or corals. Or we go into the lab and we, we culture organisms, so we grow some coccolithophores or grow some foraminifera in the lab at known temperatures, okay? And we measure the water in which they grew in terms of its isotopic composition, and we basically produce a calibration curve, okay? And you can see here that for different, these, I think these are all different kinds of foraminifera. Um, I think these guys are benthics, mostly. Um, you can see that for different organisms, we get a slightly different calibration curve, okay? Which means that at least, well, at least two of those curves can't be the isotopic equilibrium curve. Possibly all three of them can't be. But it doesn't matter because we've now got a calibration curve. Um, and we can do this over, we can, if, we, if we restrict our species a little bit more, we can do this and we get quite a nice straight line. Okay, so there's a lot less gas in this kind of plot than before. And we produce a calibration curve. And, it, and to, to give a kind of a, some context of how little this relates to our thermodynamic expected temperature relationship, uh, this is the equation of that line that, that is used. And you can see that it's not a 1 over T relationship. Okay, it's, uh, it's they, we just use a quadratic. So it's a very similar curve. Okay, so some of you that did EMP2 should, should know that you can, you, can, you can approximate any curve over a small enough distance using a quadratic equation, polynomial. Um, so that's all we're doing here. So we, although thermodynamically it shouldn't be a quadratic relationship, we can use a quadratic relationship because it's easier to regress the data through. And, that, and that's, you know... It's as really as, as straightforward as that. So we can produce these um, empirical calibration curves. Um, quite often, uh, not even using alpha, we just use the difference between two um, kind of measurements of the, the carbonate in the water. And even in this case, uh, because it's an empirical calibration, we're not so worried about the thermodynamics, uh, they've not even bothered to convert the two delta values of the carbonate and the water into the same standard, okay? So this is carbonate relative to PDB, this is carbonate relative to SMO. Because it's a constant offset, it doesn't matter, okay? So we produce these empirical calibration curves. And it turns out that this happens quite a lot in isotope geochemistry in that there's some 
fundamental thermodynamic reason for something happening. But it turns out that there are all of these assumptions that go into kind of that statement. So what happens is we basically have to go through this process of doing an empirical calibration. Okay? So when you're looking at data in the future and you're kind of trying to critically assess stuff, think about what is the calibration that they've used for that data? Is it appropriate? So for instance, uh, this is a calibration curve based on these unpronounceable Sibusoides and Platulina foraminifera. Okay. Would it be appropriate to apply that calibration to measurements of a coral? Okay. Probably not. Okay. But you could apply that calibration and get maybe a qual qualitative assessment of temperature change. Is it warmer or colder rather than is it warmer or colder by a certain amount? Okay. So that's, that's an important part of the, the reason why we're doing this, this course. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so there's another problem with isotopic equilibration, and this is really um, specific to high temperature systems. So equilibration here, once again, is very difficult because you're looking at mineral phases. So there might be some isotopic exchange between two solids, okay? but those, it's very hard to get something out of one solid and into another solid. Now, uh, these, uh, these minerals, say quartz, magnetite, platyclase, olivine, these, these are kind of minerals that, that may be precipitating or crystallizing from a fluid. So you could see that there might be some isotopic exchange between the melt or the, the, the fluid and the mineral as they're growing in the same way as calcium carbonate and, and seawater. Um, but it has to then go back into another mineral. Okay, so, um, so this, is, this, is, this is an example that I think I went through you know, let's say if you, if last week that if you, because there's an isotopic fractionation between these, these phases, because the oxygen is bound in a slightly different bonding environment in all of these different minerals, if you can measure the difference, you can kind of read off the temperature, basically. And that's all this equation here is doing. So uh, one, of the, one of the things about this isotopic group, you can't just pick any two minerals in a rock. Okay? Because if this, if, this, if, this, if this state here is happening, so this is olivine and this is plagioclase, um, if oxygens are going to be exchanging with the fluid as this thing is growing, okay, I should have really put this oxygen on the surface because it's not actually exchanging out of the middle of the crystal, it's just as it's growing. If that's going to exchange through the fluid to an olivine crystal, okay, those crystals have to be growing at the same time. Okay, it can't be one grows, one crystallizes, and then another one crystallizes, because then they won't be in con effectively in contact at the same time, so isotopes can exchange between the two. So for the, for the, um, for the plagioclase olivine system, uh, you can see that um, you should be familiar with phase diagrams like this from geomaterials. So one person nodded, so you all should understand, okay? Um, so this, this implies that for this system, this should work. So as you maybe cool down, you get to this kind of cotectic here, and you should at some point be precipitating anothite and forstrite at the same time, which means there'll be an opportunity for isotopes to be incorporated in those in equilibrium with the fluid. <coughs> okay? So, um, unlike calcium carbonate in, in water, one of the problems we have is that high temperature systems are at high temperature. So what all I've been saying about once a, an atom is kind of locked in a crystal, it's kind of there and can't interact with the fluid again, that's not true with solids at high temperatures. Because especially in geology, where time is very, very long, kind of, it is possible for atoms to diffuse through solids. So if you leave two minerals in contact with each other for a long enough amount of time at a high enough temperature, it is possible for atoms to diffuse from one to the other. It's why you don't get zoning in some minerals and you do get zoning in others. So for instance, zoned minerals diffusion is very, very slow, but unzoned minerals like olivine, there's been chance for the chemical composition to be kind of diffused away. Um, so it de that, that diffusion can depend on whether it's wet or dry. So you can see for a feldspar, the diffusion is, if you follow this line down, it would be much slower than a wet feldspar Okay, where the diffusion rate would be very fast. You see the scale here, it's kind of 10 to the, 10 to the minus 10 to 10 to the minus 20 centimetres squared per second. So very slow, but fortunately for geologists, there are a lot of seconds in a million years. Okay. 
Um, okay, so this, um, yeah, so at um, uh, high temperatures, this diffusion can happen quite a lot faster. And this is, uh, this is a little aside here. So this is, um, this is important for if you're considering kind of is the isotope exchange after crystallization. So those temperatures from the isotope ratio between two mineral phases are a uh, minimum temperature of crystallization. So the minerals could have crystallized higher temperature, then more diffusion could have happened, and then it cools down so you can't then get isotope mixing. Um, but it's also important for quite a lot of geochronology um, applications. So not necessarily just isotope exchange, but also elemental exchange. So for instance, at, um, if we look at uh, where's argon-argon dating, so that's looking at uh, uh, a mineral that has um, argon and potassium in it. Okay, so at higher temperatures, okay, the argon and that's produced by potassium K can diffuse out of the crystal. Only once the crystal has cooled down to a relatively cold 300 degrees Celsius will those kind of elements be locked in and won't be able to diffuse out. So this kind of concept of diffusion through solids and closure temperature is important for geochronology, which Jeff might go into in his lectures. Okay, so, um, so that was basically just a, 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 a short-ish, half hour long, recap of isotope equilibration, okay, which is uh, an important um, kind of concept for you to get because it allows you to critically analyse oxygen isotope data. So for the rest of the lecture part of today's um, uh, geochemical fiasco, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, boron isotopes. So uh, boron isotopes are um, the, the latest new thing since about 10 years ago uh, in our isotope geochemistry. Uh, so boron has two isotopes, 10 and 11. Both have five protons, one has six uh, neutrons, the other one's um, five. So because they've got a low mass, okay, compared to heavier elements, by definition, um, uh, they have quite a large relative mass difference between them. Okay, so that means that you would expect them to have a large isotope fractionation. Um, now, in the aqueous environment, so in water, uh, boron is, is very, very soluble. Okay, so it forms these two chemical species, boric acid, and the borate ion. And those are in equilibrium with each other in the same way that uh, carbonate and bicarbonate and carbonic acid and bicarbonate are kind of in equilibrium. <coughs> um, so there's a lot of this stuff in the ocean. Um, and you can see that this equilibrium here has got a hydrogen ion in it. Okay? Which means that the, um, the proportions of borate to boric acid will be dependent on the pH of the solution. Okay, so this this leads us to this kind of uh, this this idea that maybe we can use this system to tell us about past ocean pH. Okay, or maybe not just past ocean pH, but the pH of any fluid that a boron-bearing mineral has precipitated from. Okay. So it's useful for paleoceanography, but it's also useful for studies of biocalcification. Might be useful for, for ore forming processes as well. Um, so this is uh, this is kind of why one of the reasons why we're interested in in reconstructing pH. Um, so this is the uh, a map of the sea surface difference in pH from pre-industrial to present. So if you add CO2 to water, the pH goes down which you should mostly all be fairly familiar with. Okay? So CO2 forms carbonic acid, acidifies the water. So if we know the pH of the water, we might be able to back out the CO2 concentration. So we might be able to, boron isotopes might give us a window into being able to reconstruct past atmospheric CO2 concentrations. Okay? Because if we know pH and we know the concentration of one of these other things, Okay, carbonate ion, carbonate ion, bicarbonate, or the total amount of dissolved organic carbon, we can work out, ultimately, back through all of these equations, what um, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere was. 
And that's important if we want to understand the evolution of the planet and how the climate has changed and what forcings have, have changed that. So this is a, a compilation uh, from Wikipedia, which is an old plot, should probably be updated by now, with some of our past estimates of, of um, uh, from using a bunch of different methods, through modeling, through using fossil leaves to matter, um, and also some of these data are boron isotope data, of, of what um, the atmospheric CO2 concentration was in the past. So you can see in periods where we might think it might have been a bit warmer in the Cretaceous, we might have high CO2, maybe high CO2 at the beginning of um, the Phanerozoic as well. Uh, but it, there's a lot of uncertainty in these estimates, so it would be a good idea to, to improve on those, and maybe boron isotopes is our ticket out of here. Um, so I mentioned that there, there should be a, a large isotope fractionation because there's a large relative difference between the masses of the two isotopes. Also, the two species that we're interested in here, so this is uh, boric acid, this is the borate iron, there should be a minus on here somewhere, but I'd, I'd probably put it in, in white or something stupid. Um, those compounds are covalently bonded, or at least the boron in the middle of them is covalently bonded to the oxygens. So that means that, again, there should be a large isotope fractionation. Okay? So there are a number of different estimates of exactly what that fractionation is, but uh, it's quite large. So 1.027, okay, so that doesn't sound like very different from 1, but it's actually approximately a 27 parts per thousand difference, which in terms of isotope fractionation is, is quite big. Um, so I mentioned that there was this dependence on pH of the speciation of the two compounds, so uh, between boric acid and borate. Okay, so you can, you can re rewrite that as a chemical uh, equilibrium uh, with an with a equilibrium constant. And you can see how that, because there's a hydrogen in that, that the, the relative portions of the two uh, species is, um, is dependent on pH. Now, fortunately for us paleoceanographers, uh, the scale over which this, this crossover happens is very similar to the pH of the ocean. The pH of the ocean is currently about here, 8.05 something. Okay? So we're on this bit of the graph here where there's a, a big slope, which means that this proxy should be sensitive to pH change in the ocean. Okay? If, the, if the ocean pH was 7, okay, it, it wouldn't be so sensitive. So if someone's using this boron isotope tool to tell you about pH changes in their ore forming region, they go, oh, well, the pH was 4 and then changed to 5, and I've got all this information from boron isotopes. You say, well, mm, no. Okay? Um, yeah, so this is, um, this is, this is a, um, how that, that plot looks in isotope space. So you can see here that the two, there's an isotope difference between the boric acid and the borate iron, okay, which is approximately almost, in this case, uh, 40 per mil, 36 per mil. Um, and this is where modern carbonates plot on this. So they've got a pH from the ocean, about 8.1 something, 8.0 something. Um, and they have this value close to the composition of, of boric acid. Okay, so it seems that if we can maybe, if there is a relationship between the carbonate and the boric acid in the borate iron, Okay, we might be able to, to, to make some use of that. And we'll come on to, to how that, uh, those assumptions play through later. So uh, this is where some of the horrible equation stuff starts, but um, don't worry so much about it. Um, so we know that the total boron isotope composition, so the, the total concentration of all both boron species, okay, um, should stay constant unless we're adding or taking away boron from the ocean, and it turns out that that's unlikely because there is so much boron already in the ocean. It's kind of like adding kind of a million tonnes of chlorine to the ocean will have no impact on the chlorine concentration because there's already a, like a quazillion, like a large number with lots of zeros on concentration of chlorine. Okay? It's got a very long residence time, okay? so it's not going to change, probably. Um, so that composition can be expressed as the sum of the concentrations of the individual species of boric acid and borate iron times their isotope ratios. So I have expressed the isotope ratios here in absolute terms rather as the delta values. Um, and it usually doesn't make a difference. It will make a difference if by chance one of your delta values one of, if it is zero. Because then this equation kind of like falls apart spectacularly. 
But if you use the absolute isotope ratios rather than the delta values, it's fine. So this is why we have to then do horrible maths, because we can't measure these terms. Okay? Uh, we have uh, this alpha, which is the difference basically between these two, or the ratio of the, the isotope ratio to these two phases. Okay, so we can express that thus, rearrange that to get the isotopic composition of maybe the boric acid as a function of the borate ion. We just substitute that into this equation to get rid of one of the terms. That's what's happened there, and then I factorized it out at the bottom. So if you can, don't worry if you can't follow this as we go through. I've given you the things, and you can, you can go through it at your own pace if you're interested, but I'll, 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 I'll struggle on. So we can then rearrange that term to get, give us, because what we ideally want to do is understand how this borate ion isotope composition changes with pH. So I've rearranged that to give me this equation here in terms of just what is the dependency of the borate ion and that's an equation that's got the, the total amount of boron and its isotope composition. So if that, if that changes, which would require adding huge amounts of boron to the ocean, then the whole composition, I think, would move up and down. But it's dependent on the fractionation factor and the, um, the, the concentration of the two species. Okay? So fractionation factor times one of them. So the proportions of these two species will affect the isotope ratio. So now, uh, to convert that into delta notation, all I'm doing is uh, rearranging our per mil equation, which is the ratio of the sample divided by a standard. So I can then plug in this rearranged, this, this is rearranged that, to give the boron isotope ratio of the sample, which gives us, I've just plugged, plugged in to this equation at the bottom. Okay? So you can see that I've substituted that for basically this. Same here for that. Okay, so you can immediately see some stuff starts to cancel out. So, for instance, you can divide through by the, the standard, which is quite good because the standard is arbitrary. So it's good to get rid of that. Um, we can start to then rearrange this back out to try and isolate just the delta term and get rid of some of this stuff that we've converted in here. Okay, so that, that, that goes through that. There, it gets kind of hideously more complicated, but not... Ridiculously so, we're just multiplying out this bracket to get rid of the, the stuff that, so we can I isolate the delta term here. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is just more of that maths. Um, not so much. Um, right, so eventually you get to this stage here where you've done all of the rearranging that you can and you've then got this equation where you've got the boron isotope composition of the boric acid is equal to the total um, uh, boron isotope composition. Um, we've still got the um, fractionation factor times the borate, boric acid, and the borate iron concentration. So it's still dependent on the proportions of the two species. Um, but we've got this other alpha, other fractionation factors that's basically popped up, which is the same as this one, it's just popped up here. So does this, does this alpha minus 1 times 10 to the 3, does that actually mean anything? Can we simplify that to something? So if you could think back to, to, to our, our kind of like our fundamental kind of just how we describe isotope fractionation. So alpha fractionation factor is the ratio between the two species. Um, so we can, we can express that in terms of the delta notation by replacing the ratio by the rearranged per mil equation to get the ratio, and that's just, and there should be, you can have a time standard in here, but that, that's obviously going to cancel out, as does this 10 to the 3, that cancels out to get this. Now, what if one of the phases that we're comparing in this alpha, um, in this fractionation factor, has a, a has a delta value of zero. So it's kind of imagining you took your arbitrary standard and then worked out how much your, your sample was fractionated away from that. Okay? So if you do that, if you assume that this delta thing is zero here, that makes the bottom of this equation kind of, uh, one. So you divide by one, you get the same thing. That, so that disappears to give you this equation. And then that gives us 
So the, the, the per mil or the delta value of a phase is alpha minus 1 away from the arbitrary standard. So it's kind of like what the fractionation factor between two phases would be if one of those phases is your arbitrary standard. So it's kind of a way of expressing the fractionation factor in per mil notation rather than in as a, a ratio of two ratios. Okay, so that, that's, that's what this epsilon term here is defined as. So in the last lecture, I told you that there was another reason we use epsilon. So sometimes when delta values are very, very small, when we have very small isofractation, sometimes people use epsilon. There are two uses for the term, for the symbol epsilon in isotope geology, which is annoying, um, but you should be aware of it. So sometimes when people, when in papers, you'll see uh, the isotope fractionation factor, it will be dis described as an alpha, which will be 1 point something, or 0 .0, 0 0.999 something. Okay, it will be a number near 1. Whereas if it's expressed as an epsilon value, it will be a, a, a small number between you know, around 0. So, um, so yeah, so that's this, this, uh, this thing here. Uh, yeah, I think I've put more slides in there than I um, So, if we uh, um, use um, this, this notation here to look at the, the fractionation factor between two phases, okay, so the, the difference between phase A and phase B, so now we're not, we're not saying that either one of these is going to be um, zero. Um, we, we can rearrange that, okay, so times both sides by um, delta B plus 1,000, uh, minus 1,000 for both sides to get that, this, this guy here, you multiply that out, um, and then you get this term here, which is this. Okay, you can see delta A equals delta B times alpha plus it's effectively epsilon. So this should look a little bit familiar to you because this is how we convert between having two different standards. Okay, because the delta, um, the difference in delta values of isotopes expressed as um, if you use different standards, is effectively the fractionation factor between those two standards, um, which is where this equation comes from. So um, back to boron isotopes. So we can replace this alpha minus 1 times 10 to the 1,000 with this epsilon term here. So uh, we now have uh, an equation where we've got the delta 11 of boron in borate iron Okay, is equal to this thing here. So this is dependent on the isotopic composition of the total boron pool and the uh, amount of this you have compared to the amount of this you have. Boric acid to borate time. Uh, and the fractionation factor, or the, and the fractionation factor expressed in per mil notation. So how do we get those um, those proportions of different species. So we showed this earlier on. So this is the equation that shows the basically reaction between boric acid, water, and the borate, forming the borate ion and hydrogen ions. So this is this kind of uh, chemical equilibria here. Okay. So you can rearrange that, kind of multiply both sides by boric acid, add borate ion to both sides. Okay, then you can factorize that out. Um, and that gives you uh, this equation ultimately for the concentration of boric acid, sorry, borate iron, is equal to the total concentration divided by 1 plus the hydrogen ion, hydrogen ion concentration divided by the equilibrium constant. So you can go through those, you should be able to, how you get from one to the other. Now, this means that this concentration is inversely proportional to the pH. Okay, so you can, this 
10 to the power of pK minus pH, that's the same as the ratio between those, because if you take the ratio of two numbers is the same as the, the, basically the any log of the one number minus the other number. That should, um, that should be familiar from maths. Um, so you can, put in, you can start to plug these values, these, equ these equations, back into that equation for the, for the borate iron isotopic composition. And we do that because this equation then has something with pH in it. Okay, So that's what um, we've got here. So we've got an equation for the borate iron concentration, an equation for the boric acid concentration. That's equal to this and this. And we can then substitute these equations into this equation okay, to get this equation. Now, I haven't gone through the steps of how to do that because I spent about four hours trying to do it and couldn't. Um, so I don't expect you to be able to do that in the exam. If anybody of you can do that and show me how it's done, then I'll give you £20. Um, um, so, but the, the thing I want you to get from this um, is not all of that rearranging. It's that by doing that, okay, is that you can, you can go from that, those simple concepts of the speciation of boric acid and borate iron is pH dependent, okay, and the isotope mass balance, which is the total isotopic composition times the total concentration is the sum of the individual components' concentration and their individual isotopic compositions. Okay? From those two statements, you can get to this equation, where you have the isotopic composition of the borate iron is equal to something okay, that has the fractionation factor between the two species and is dependent on pH. Okay? It's also, unfortunately, dependent on the equilibrium constant. And we'll come to how that is important in a bit as well. Okay? So, um, in fact, we'll come to that now. Um, so, you can, you can rearrange that equation that I've just showed you to get an equation for pH. So, if you know all of the isotopic compositions, so if you know the total isotopic composition of boron in seawater, and you know the isotopic composition of the borate iron, if you know what alpha is, you can work out what the pH is. So if we can measure the isotopes, we have an equation that will tell us what the pH is. Um, so the slight problem with that is that we also need to know what this is, what the equilibrium constant between the two species is. Now, you should know that the equilibrium constant of any reaction is dependent on temperature. Yeah? Just like the fractionation factor is dependent on temperature. Okay? So we make all of these assumptions. Okay, so we want to know okay, the pH of the borate iron because that is dependent on pH. Okay? We're measuring the boron that's incorporated in calcium carbonate. Okay? So we have to make an assumption that we know the fractionation factor between borate iron and carbonate. Now, I haven't really mentioned that at all, okay? but it's likely to be small okay? because, um, because, well, we don't actually know how boron is incorporated into calcium carbonate, but it it's likely to be substituted as a whole borate um, iron rather than as an individual boron atom, which means that it will stay in the same bonding environment that it was outside of the uh, well, similar bonding environment. So it's kind of like it's being ionically bonded, but it, the, it's the whole borate iron rather than the um, uh, rather than the uh, just a boron iron. Okay, which also makes the relative mass difference a lot smaller because rather than just being looking at boron, you're looking at the mass of the whole iron. Um, so we also don't know whether that is in equilibrium or not. It's very unlikely to be in equilibrium um, because you've got to take something 
from the water, it's got to go through an organism into the carbonate. So even if we, if, we, if we make some sensible assumptions about that, we can maybe get back to the borate ion concentration, sorry, our isotopic composition. We want the pH. The pH is dependent on the, oh, sorry, the, the pH, the um, uh, equilibrium constant, and the fractionation factor, which will be temperature dependent because it's a fractionation factor. That they all affect the boron isotope composition of the borate ion, as does, in fact, the total boron isotope composition. Uh, we can kind of say that this isn't going to change much because there's so much boron in the ocean and it's very <coughs> conservative. Oh, that, that's ruined the recording for people who didn't turn up. Um, so, what do we do? We do an empirical calibration. Okay, when I say do we, um, oh, I'll just, uh, yeah. Um, other people do, so these guys are Gavin Foster and, and James Ray. Um, so the, what we've got here, we've got pH across the, the bottom axis here of a bunch of samples that they found either in the ocean or they've cultured in the lab, um, and they've measured their boron isotope composition and compared it to the pH of the water. Um, and the gray line on here is what you would expect if they were precipitating, if, if if they were, instead of measuring the carbonate, they were measuring the isotopic composition of the borate iron. Okay, so you can see that there is some difference between what's recorded in the calcium carbonate and what's in the borate iron. And that's mostly, mostly, well, that is due to there being a small fractionation between the two, and also because that fractionation is not equilibrium. Okay, so what do we do about that? We just, um, we just do an empirical calibration. So we take our measurements of borate of, of the, in the carbonate, we do a regression, and we basically uh, correct for the difference that there is from the expected kind of isotopic composition of uh, borate uh, iron and the measured. So that's what we do. So we're basically just correcting these points back to this kind of theoretical line here. Um, and from that, we're able to ignore this equilibrium constraint, ignore the fact that there is a fractionation between borate iron and calcium carbonate, because we've just done an empirical calibration. So that does mean that you need to do a different calibration for different species, for different kind of minerals, so aragonite versus calcite samples will behave differently. But it does mean that we can, by doing an empirical calibration, we can still get to, to here. So we're closer to where we want to be. So to get rid of the temperature effects on these two terms here, we just need to then measure another proxy what, that will tell us what the temperature is. So you should know from the practical that a good choice would be the magnesium calcium ratio in four amps. Okay? So this is this is the this is what we basically we have. We have we don't know the total isotopic composition of boron in the ocean, but we know that it's a conservative element with a long residence time. So if it is going to change, it will change very slowly. Okay, so if we see short-term changes in the boron isotopic composition, that can't be due to changes in the total amount. Maybe on very long time scales, geological time scales, tens to hundreds of millions of years, it might change. Um, we don't know this guy, or well, equilibrium constant, so we can basically, if we don't know the temperature, we need to measure it by some other proxy. Um, salinity we can kind of ignore because it's a small effect and pressure you kind of try and make, use samples that have formed at similar pressures. So either all planktonic forearms or um, deep ocean where the water depth changes as much. So this is kind of where we, where we go with this. So uh, we can measure the boron isotopes in, in this case, um, uh, planktonic forearms, and we can basically go back through the carbonate system. We know pH, we know the carbonate ion concentration, how much carbon there is in, uh, for the, um, the total DIC. Um, we, can, we can start to reconstruct atmospheric CO2 from those boron isotope measurements. We can compare that to the red curve, which is what we know from the ice cores. Okay, so this kind of gives us some confidence that our proxy is working. So this is another thing that, that's, that's also important in using isotopes in, in geosciences, that if you've got this technique which you think is a proxy for something, okay, you have to test it. 
And in this case, we've got a data series, quite fortunate that the thing we're trying to reconstruct is a thing that we have a record for. We have a good record for atmospheric CO2. So we can test the proxy, see if it records the, the magnitude of the glacial interglacial cycles, which it kind of does, and it seems to do quite well through time as well. So that's kind of like the shown in this plot here. So the, the, the carbon dioxide estimated for boron, the real carbon dioxide, we seem to do a fairly good job of reconstructing that. So now we've got a proxy. We can take it to places where we don't have direct measurements. So these are those data that I've just showed you. So we can go back through time okay, and start looking at reconstructing the carbon dioxide concentration from these boron isotope measurements <coughs> kind of for, for parts of the, the record where we don't have that data. So this is, uh, this is an example, um, I think it's from the, the Pacific. Um, but it doesn't, doesn't really matter because the atmospheric CO2 concentration is kind of the same everywhere-ish. Um, so we can see here that back to 2 million years ago, this relationship between carbon dioxide concentration and the temperature of the planet, as in this case, uh, we've got uh, oxygen isotopes. So that's a combination of temperature and ice volume. But we also have estimates of sea surface temperature locally from magnesium calcium. Okay, so that's, that's what's been used to kind of account for the, the temperature effect um, of, um, on the equilibrium constants. Um, so we can see that this is now providing us useful information that we didn't have before. So we, we, we kind of know that, that CO2 wasn't kind of whacking crazy up here in the past. It wasn't really, really low. It has been reasonably constant throughout the quaternary, except for when we kind of like put loads in. So it stayed, it's never been, it's never been at 400 parts per million, which is on this scale here-ish, roughly. Even counting all of the uncertainties in the data. We can take it even further back in time. So uh, it's, it's, always, it's always a little bit concerning if you measure a proxy back through time and it shows no change. Because that might just mean that your proxy is completely insensitive to large perturbations in, in the system. Um, so we go to this place. So I showed this kind of uh, last week. This is the PETM, or the Late Paleocene Thermal Maximum here. Um, so this is an oxygen isotope record. So this is. Again, a combination of the amount of ice volume and temperature. Uh, but can, because they both go in the same direction, we can say that this, you know, when it's hot, you kind of lose all of the ice. Anyway, this, this, this tiny little spike here, it's actually a massive spike, um, is an extreme warm period. We can see zoomed in on that here. So basically the, the scale now is, is, instead of being in millions of years into the past, it's basically normalized to the, the start of this event here, and then it's in scaled in, in, um, in thousands of years. Okay? So this is 100,000, 200,000 years later. So it's, it's quite a long-lasted event and as far as you know, human history is, but goes. But, uh, so we can see here magnesium-calcium ratio. So this was magnesium-calcium ratio goes up at the beginning of this event. So that is another indication of it being a warming. Uh, but we can see in our boron isotopes now, uh, we get this drop in boron isotopes, which implies we're getting basically more of the boric acid rather than the borate ion, which implies that we're getting lower pH. And you can see once we've converted that to pH, you can see actually we do get this quite big, kind of almost maybe two and a bit, sorry, point two and a bit pH units, which is a huge pH change. Um, uh, and that coincides with this change in carbon isotopes. So we're getting much more light carbon isotopes. So you remember from last week that that is an indicator of us adding uh, carbon to the system that's got an isotopically light signature. So methane, fossil fuels, probably not us burning fossil fuels this time. So it's probably, in this case, a release of natural methane hydrates. And that matches with the acidification, because if you put a bunch of carbon in the atmosphere, it should acidify the oceans. And that's what we're seeing here. Okay, so to summarise, um, this, this concept of isotopic equilibrium is, is kind of really important that you have a, a really good grasp of all of the, the caveats that go with that in terms of what, what can cause there to be not isotopic equilibrium in terms of uh, stopping there being an exchange between the two, two 
basis, either water, um, calcium carbonate, or two, two minerals. Um, and this is why, having done all of this kind of physics and maths and figured out why the isotopic fractionate should fractionate in the first place, we almost always end up doing these empirical calibrations. Okay, so we also go out, find some samples that we know what pH, what temperature, what salinity, whatever it is we're trying to reconstruct, what they grew at, and then measure them, and then make a calibration line. Now, that calibration line ideally would use an equation of the form that is expected from the thermo thermodynamics, but sometimes, in the case of oxygen isotopes, we can't often just use a quadratic function because it's easy to approximate a curved line with that. Um, yeah, so this, this the next point about the isotopic exchange, so that's set at the time the mineral forms, but in the case of high temperature systems, that might not be the case. So if you've got, maybe looking at the, using isotopes to, to record the temperature at which some, some cr minerals crystallized in an igneous rock, what you're getting there is a minimum temperature, because they might have crystallized at a higher temperature, but carried on exchanging their isotopes until they cool down to a point when diffusion slows down enough that they can't diffuse out of the mineral. Um, and then boron isotopes. So boron isotopes are becoming much more widely used as a measure of um, pH. Uh, and from that, we can start to back out properties of the carbon system in the past, past oceans, which is really, really important. Um, that proxy works because of this pH-dependent speciation of the two boron-bearing species, bor boric acid and borate iron. And there's a big isotope fractionation between those two. And that's because there's a big relative mass difference and the two species are covalently bonded. Okay? But again, we need to go back to this empirical calibration because there are all of these other things that affect our isotope ratio other than the thing we're interested in. Okay? 